time it is. <laughs> Get into it! Yes! We're back. Hi, y'all. Happy 4th of July. Welcome to Storytime with Chris. Now, as always, you do not have to watch these videos when they go live. You're more than welcome to watch them in your downtime, nap time, max relaxing time. Anytime you want to hear a highly animated voice bring you wonderful stories of magic, fantasy, science fiction, adventure, and many, many more in between. Now, today is the 4th, but I decided that I was going to read today. I have my own particular feelings about the holiday, and, you know, that's how I'm going to keep it. Obviously, people are out watching, going to see fireworks and grilling out and so on and so forth, and I completely support that. But I choose to stay at home, and typically, traditionally, and people are going to laugh at this, but anybody who's a real fan knows why I do this. So, instead of going out for fireworks or going out to cook out or something like that, one, because I've been particularly tired lately, um, another reason is because every 4th of July, I watch Christopher Reeve's Superman the Movie. And the tagline in that movie, which is a very famous quote, you will believe a man can fly. And Superman, to me, expresses what I consider to be the quintessential uh, focus of what the quote-unquote American dream should be. He gives justice to the weak and the oppressed. Key words here, justice for the weak and the oppressed. Truth, justice, and a better and brighter tomorrow. That's why I watched that movie. And plus, I adore Christopher Reeves. He's one of my biggest role models growing up as a kid. And I still have an immense amount of respect for him even after he has passed. So, without further ado, you didn't come to hear me blather. You came to hear a story. So, we'll go ahead and get started. Now, if you see my attention dart away, it's because there is, unfortunately, a fly in here. And it's going to drive me crazy because I don't like that because I don't like my floating friends flying around in the midst of me reading a good story so there's that all right now let's go ahead and get started and no I do not own the music that you're listening to in the background a series of unfortunate events the miserable meal chapter six I tell you, you have nothing to worry about, Phil said as Violet and Sonny picked at their casserole. It was dinner time, but Klaus had still not returned from Dr. Orwell's, and the young Baudelaire women were worried sick. After work, while walking across the dirty courtyard with their fellow employees, Violet and Sonny had peered worriedly at the wooden gate that led out to Paltryville, and were dismayed to see no sign of Klaus. When they arrived at the dormitory, Violet and Sonny looked out the window to watch for him, and they were so anxious that it took them several minutes to realize that the window was not a real one, but one drawn on the blank wall with a ballpoint pen. Then they went out and sat on the doorstep, looking out at the empty courtyard. Until Phil called them in to supper, and now it was getting on toward bedtime, and not only had their brother still not returned, but Phil was insisting that they had nothing to worry about. I think we do, Phil, Violet said. I think we do have something to worry about. Klaus has been gone all afternoon, and Sonny and I are worried that something might have happened to him. Something awful. Beaker, Sonny agreed. I know that doctors can seem scary to young children, Phil said, but doctors are your friends, and they can't hurt you. Violet looked at Phil and saw that their conversation would go nowhere. You're right, she said, tiredly, even though he was quite wrong. As anyone who's ever been to a doctor's office, doctors are not necessarily your friends any more than mail deliverers are your friends, or butchers are your friends, or refrigerator repair people are your friends. A doctor is a man or a woman whose job is it to make you feel better, that's all. And if you ever had a shot, you know that the statement, doctors can't hurt you, is simply absurd. Violet and Sonny, of course, were worried that Dr. Orwell had some connection with Count Olaf, not that their brother would get a shot, but it was useless to try to explain such things to an optimist. So they merely picked at their casserole and waited for their brother until it was time for bed. Dr. Orwell must have fallen behind his, his appointments, Violet said. Excuse me, Phil said. As Violet and Sonny tucked themselves into the bottom bunk, his waiting room must be absolutely full. Shushki, Sonny said sadly, which meant something along the lines of, I hope so, Phil. Phil smiled at the two Baudelaire's and turned out the lights in the dormitory. 
The employees whisper to each other for a few minutes, and then they were quiet. And before too long, Violet and Sunny were surrounded by the sound of snores. The children did not sleep, of course, but stared out into the dark room with a growing feeling of dismay. Sunny made a squeaky, sad noise like the closing of a door, and Violet took her sister's fingers, which were sore from tying knots all day long, and blew on them gently. But even as the Baudelaire fingers felt better, the Baudelaire sisters did not. They lay together on the bunk and tried to imagine where Klaus could be and what was happening to him. But one of the worst things about Count Olaf is that his evil ways are so despicable that it is impossible to imagine what would be up his sleeve next. All to get his hands on the Baudelaire fortune. That, Violet and Sonny could scarcely bear to think what might be happening to their brother. The evening grew later and later, and the two siblings began to imagine more and more terrible things that could be happening to Klaus while they lay helpless in the dormitory. Skin Tom Kuni, Sonny whispered finally, and Violet nodded. They had to go look for him. The expression, quiet as mice, is a puzzling one, because mice can often be very noisy. So people who are being quiet as mice may be, in fact, be squeaking and scrambling around. The expression, quiet as mimes, is more appropriate, because mimes are people who perform theatrical routines without making a sound. Mimes are annoying and embarrassing, but they are much quieter than mice, so quiet as mimes is a more proper way to describe how Violet and Sunny got from their bunk, tiptoed across the dormitory, and walked out into the night. There was a full moon that night, and the children gazed for a moment at the quiet courtyard. The moonlight made the dirt floor look as strange and eerie as the surface of the moon. Violet picked Sunny up, and the two of them crossed the courtyard toward the heavy wooden gate leaning out of the lumber mill. The only sound was the soft shuffling of Violet's feet. The orphans could not remember when they had been in a place that felt so quiet and still, which, which is why the sudden creaking sound made them jump in surprise. The creaking sound was noisy as mice and seemed to be coming from straight ahead. Violet and Sunny stared out into the gloom with another creak. <coughs> Excuse me. Ah. Sorry, my pendant is really heavy. It's one of my favorite ones. I need to get some water. Hold on. All right. okay. Violet and Sunny stared out into the gloom, open, and with another creak, the wooden gate swung open and revealed the short figure of a person walking slowly toward them. Klaus, Sunny said, for one of the few regular words she used was the name of her brother. And to her relief, Violet saw that it was indeed Klaus who was walking toward them. He had on a new pair of glasses that looked just like his old ones, except they were so new that they shone in the moonlight. He gave his sisters a dazed and distant smile as if they were people he did not know so well. Klaus, we were so worried about you, Violet said, hugging her brother as he reached them. You were gone for so long. Whatever happened to you? I don't know, Klaus said so quietly that his sisters had to lean forward to hear him. I can't remember. Did you see Count Olaf? Violet asked. Was Dr. Orwell working with him? Did they do anything to you? I don't know, Klaus said, shaking his head. I remember breaking my glasses, and I remember Charles taking me to the eye-shaped building. But I don't remember anything else. I scarcely remember where I am right now. Klaus, Violet said firmly, you are at the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill in Paltryville. Surely you remember that. Klaus did not answer. He merely looked at his sisters with wide, wide eyes as if they were an interesting aquarium or a parade. Klaus, Violet said, I said you are at the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill. Klaus still did not answer. He must be very tired, Violet said to Sunny. Libo, Sunny said doubtfully. You better get to bed, Klaus, Violet said. Follow me. At last, Klaus spoke. Yes, sir, he said quietly. Sir? Violet repeated. I'm not a sir. I'm your sister. But Klaus was silent once more, and Violet gave up. Still carrying Sunny, she walked back to the dormitory, and Klaus shuffled behind her. The moon shone on his new glasses, and his steps made little clouds of dirt, but he didn't say a word. Quiet as mimes, the Baudelaire's walked back into the... Oh, excuse me. The dormitory and tiptoed to their bunk bed. 
But when they reached it, Klaus merely stood nearby and stared at his two siblings as if he had forgotten how to go to bed. Lie down, Klaus, Violet said gently. Yes, sir, Klaus replied and laid down on the bottom bunk, still staring at his sisters. Violet sat on the edge of the bunk and removed Klaus's shoes, which he had forgotten to take off, but it seemed that he did not even notice. We'll discuss things in the morning, Violet whispered. In the meantime, Klaus, try to get some sleep. Yes, sir, Klaus said and immediately shut his eyes. In a second, he was fast asleep. Violet and Sonny watched the way his mouth quivered, just as if he had always done when he was asleep ever since he was a tiny baby. It was a relief to have Klaus back with them, of course, but the Baudelaire sisters did not feel relieved. Not one bit. They had never seen their brother act so strangely. For the rest of the night, Violet and Sonny huddled together on the top bunk, peering down and watching Klaus sleep. No matter how much they looked at him, it still felt like their brother had not returned. And that is where we will end for tonight. You know, once we finish this book, we're actually going to get to one of my favorite books in the sequence. Actually, book five, six, seven... Five, six, seven, and twelve. Those are my favorite books in the series of unfortunate events. For specific reasons. But as always, I will see you all next time.